who would forge hadith? So this is the second question. Okay, so um, you, you, would, you noticed in the previous slide that I, I said most of the forgeries were, uh, or most false attributions were actual intentional forgeries. Who would be motivated to attribute statements to the Prophet Well, here you have to identify um, the predominant context in the time of the forgeries. Anything that had authority, a statement or an action that had authority in Islamic civilization would have to have origins in revelation, right? So if someone wanted to invent something, wanted to support a political uh, uh, party, well, not a party, but like a, a political uh, movement, uh, like the Khawarij, um, or somebody wanted to um, falsely attribute a theology to Islam, the only way they could actually effectively do so would be to attach a, the, that false ideology or that false, uh, that false idea to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Qur'an was very hard to, to do that with, right? Although there were attempts even there right, to make claims that there was missing ayats of the Qur'an, or etc. So people with evil intention obviously had very clear motives in that they wanted to divide Muslims or they wanted to attribute false ideology or false theology to Islam. And so heretics or zanadiqa, zindiq people, right, who could not attack Islam politically or militarily, they would attempt to do so by corrupting people's thoughts. Right? And they would do so by, you know, disseminating false statements, attributing them to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also sectarian preachers. People who, in a time in which they should have been doing other things, were instead of, um, you know, uh, repelling falsehood, were arguing that this group is on the haq and that group is on the haq, right? This madhab is true, that madhab is, is not true, right? And they would get so heavily involved that they would go to extremes and start to concoct a hadith uh, to pr disprove the other side, right? So we know this as a, as a common phenomenon within history, and it's also in Islamic history, that one extreme leads to another extreme. And so you will find that, for example, that extreme Shafi'is would, would, would fabricate statements against Imam Abu Hanifa, and then extreme Hanafis would do the same about Imam Shafi'i, and we'll see an example of that as well. Or individuals who wanted to repel even like false uh, sects, and they were Sunni Muslims. But rather than do Islam a service by repelling them and refuting their arguments the proper way, they would actually fabricate hadith in order to do so. So like, you know, they would say, oh, the, the Jahmiya would be like one theological sect. Um, they, would, they would fabricate a hadith about them. That the Prophet ﷺ said there will be a people and, who, and, and these people will be like this and that and they'll be called the Jahmiya and they're all in the fire. And you don't need, you know, a, first of all, to have a hadith to disprove them. But it was the easy way out, right? So there would be people who, in, in their uh, zealousness, would fabricate hadith in order to refute a sect. Um, also, you know, those people who, who uh, you know, it's like today, you have like scholars and who, are, who are, I mean, they're scholarly people, but they're like, you know, um, they, they always are in, 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 in cohorts with political authorities. And they seek political favors, and whatever the, the imam or the political leader wants uh, to to do, they, they they just fabricate a hadith to support it. So we'll see also examples of, of them, sycophantic seekers of political favors. In fact, in the past, in, in, it was even part of Arab culture that poet poets would come to courts and would praise the king with the intention of, you know, getting a reward. And so there were also people who would fabricate hadiths. In that would that would actually justify some sort of behavior of the political leader, in order to get rewards. Um, storytellers, right? Uh, preachers, orators. Um, you'll see that there was classically a always a divide between the scholars, like the hadith scholars, and the qassasun, the people who storytellers. They used to call them. Uh, we call them celebrity preachers today, right? The you know the, the scholars on the stage, the scholars on the mimbars. Um, and, and, and storytellers oftentimes felt this impulse to fabricate things. Why? Because they were juicy, right? Um, people wouldn't come to them unless they were giving them new stuff. So they would make up things and then attach a sound chain to them. Why? Because they were trying to attract people towards their gatherings. 
And then unprincipled ascetics or Sufis. This is very common that you'll find that a lot of forgeries will be found in the books of the Sufis because Sufis uh, oftentimes are not critical scholars, right? Um, this is relatively rare. And, and those Sufis who were critical scholars as well were like the great Imams amongst the Sufia. But it's very common in, in Tasawwuf. And why does that happen? You know, I haven't seen this, but one of the theories that, that, that I, um, um, seems to be quite plausible is that one of the demands in Tasawwuf and spirituality is husn is uh, to kind of suppress your, your critical impulses and to accept you know, what the, the, the spiritual guide is saying uncritically. That's the only way sometimes people with arrogance in their heart are able to, uh, to, to proceed or to um, improve spiritually. And then that requires lots of commitment and, devotement and, uh, and devotion. Uh, as a result, you'll find that it's very common to find uh, those people who get into Tasawwuf and to Sufism not to be, become critical scholars. And so then they will just sort of take whatever they, they hear and they, they don't necessarily critically analyze it. But you will see that the great imams of, of the Sawwuf, they were not like that. And they were always very particular about attributing um, statements to the Prophet ﷺ because that's part of the Sawwuf as well. You know, it is not, um, it is not becoming of, of a person who loves the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be you know, um, careless in attribution of statements to him. So it's actually contradictory to the Sawwuf, but you'll find this very commonly in the books of the Sufis, that you'll find mawdu'at, uh, lots of them. And so it's a general rule in, this, in, in, in hadith that you don't uncritically take hadith from books of the Sufis or even from the lectures. Okay? As much as, as hard as that is to, do, to digest for some people, the Sufis themselves say this. <laughs> the Sufi muhaddithin are the ones who say this themselves. They do not take hadith from the books of the Sufis, right? uncritically. And if you're going to take a book of, the, of, of tasawwuf, then it should be a critically, critically edited work where someone has analyzed, like Imam Ghazali's Ihya al -Muddin. you really can't just take the, um, the Ihya al and just take any hadith from it and, 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 and think it to be a hadith because Imam Ghazali himself recognized and he acknowledged that my, you know, um, uh, my, my, uh, my skill in hadith is limited, right? Um, and so he included lots of hadith that later scholars who were very committed to Imam Ghazali as a personality, as a scholar, said that these hadith are not actually hadith. Um, so it wasn't out of like some ill intent or deceptive deception. It was just that not every hadith scholar, not every scholar uh, of, of, of spirituality is going to be also a critical scholar of hadith.